Hello and uh, good afternoon and welcome to uh, the webinar, um, Are Illicit Enrichment Laws an Underused Tool uh, to Target Corruption and Recover Stolen Assets? Uh, I'm Jonathan Spicer. I'm a Senior Asset Recovery Specialist at the Basel Institute on Governance and I will be moderating what I'm sure will be a interesting uh, discussion and an enlightening discussion on the topic of illicit enrichment. We know, don't we, that instances of corruption can often go undetected, and it's usually an agreement uh, between two or more people that's conducted in private. There's no obvious victim who can make a complaint to the police, which would then lead to an investigation. And corrupt payments that are made uh, often uh, are made outside of the jurisdiction where the corruption is taking place. However, the fruits of criminal activity can be quite apparent. Um, large expensive houses, luxury cars and extensive foreign travel. So is it better to simply target the apparent wealth rather than concerning ourselves with the criminal activity that led to it? Well, here to answer that question and to provide us with an insight into the different approaches uh, to illicit enrichment, uh, is our panel of guest speakers. And in order to focus on the topic and not lose time rehearsing people's CVs, I will, with their permission, introduce them briefly. Uh, first, we have Andrew Dornbeerer, uh, Asset Recovery Specialist at the Basel Institute and author of the newly released book, Illicit Enrichment, A Guide to Laws Targeting Unexplained Wealth. Then from Mauritius, uh, we have a dual contribution from the Integrity Reporting Services Agency. Uh, first, we have uh, Mr. Paul Keaton, uh, who is the director of that agency. Indeed, he's the first director of the agency. And, and he's a chartered accountant by background uh, with uh, a history of uh, fraud investigation. And joining him is the assistant director of the agency, Priya Raghunandram, uh, and she's responsible for financial intelligence investigations and confiscating unexplained wealth. And she has a background in financial services. Uh, Philip Kagushia uh, is a Kenyan advocate with over 15 years experience working in civil litigation and asset recovery. And he has been with the Kenyan Ethics and Anti-Corruption Commission since 2010. Tom Wolagembi uh, joins us from Uganda Prior to joining the Basel Institute as an asset recovery specialist in 2020, uh, Tom worked on asset recovery cases as a senior state attorney within the Office of the Director of Public Prosecutions of Uganda. So how are we going to approach uh, our presentation today? Well, in terms of the format, we've uh, adopted a different approach. Rather than asking each speaker to make a presentation, we're going to try and sort of focus on the different issues uh, that arise in the subject of illicit enrichment. And so we're going to direct um, questions to our panelists on each of those issues. There is an opportunity uh, for you, the attendees, um, to pose questions to the panel by using the question and answer function um, on, on the Zoom link. Um, we hope that we will be able to pose the questions uh, to the panellists during or at the end of the webinar, but if we are unable to answer all the questions uh, during the course of the webinar, we will ask the panellists uh, to provide their responses in the meeting notes which will follow um, after the uh, uh, presentation. Um, and finally to say we are recording uh, this webinar, so it may uh, you will receive after the webinar the link to the YouTube page uh, where you will be able to see uh, the recording over again um, if you should wish to. So to start um, uh, our talk today, I'm going to talk, turn first to Andrew Dornbeer. Uh, Andrew, you've carried out extensive research on the subject of illicit enrichment and indeed written a book on the subject. So can you tell us uh, what are illicit enrichment laws? How do they operate? And how do we dis distinguish them from other forms of asset recovery? Thanks, Joe. Um, so it's actually, not, it's actually not so simple and, and defining illicit enrichment um, can sometimes be 
quite difficult because there's a lot of variance in how different countries and even international treaties have defined and approached the concept of illicit enrichment. Um, even the terminology uh, used by different countries to refer to the concept of illicit enrichment differs enormously around the world. And while some countries use the term illicit enrichment, um, other countries instead refer to things such as the acquisition of unexplained wealth or unexplained property or unexplained assets. Um, and other countries, again, will use terms like illicit gains or unjustified wealth. Um, but if you, if you look at all the laws that exist around the world on this particular topic, and if you take into account all the different particular definitions that exist in these laws around the world, it's possible to come up with a somewhat universal definition for the concept of illicit enrichment. And basically at its broadest level, um, the concept of illicit enrichment refers to a situation in which someone has enjoyed an amount of wealth. And this amount of wealth is not justified by reference to their lawful income. Um, and taking this definition sort of one step further, an illicit enrichment law is basically any law that empowers a court to impose a sanction on a person purely if the court is satisfied that a person has illicitly enriched themselves, um, i.e. that they've enjoyed an amount of wealth and this amount of wealth is not justified by reference to their lawful income. Um, and when I say that illicit, an illicit enrichment law empowers a court to impose a sanction purely on this fact, um, I mean specifically that these laws don't actually require a court to be satisfied at all, that any sort of underlying or separate criminal activity has taken place before they can issue a sanction. They just need to be satisfied that a person's enjoyed an amount of wealth and this wealth isn't justified by reference to their income. That's it. Um, sometimes you, you do get slight exceptions and sometimes illicit enrichment laws uh, might require a law enforcement officer to justify a suspicion that some sort of criminality has occurred. Uh, but even in these cases, the court only really needs to be satisfied that the suspicion, that the suspicion of criminality is justified, um, not that the suspected criminal activity actually occurred. Um, another point I just wanna quickly emphasize as well is that when discussing the concept of illicit enrichment, um, it's important to remember that laws targeting illicit enrichment do not only exist in a criminal form. Um, yes, the vast, vast, vast majority of illicit enrichment laws are criminal, um, meaning that they outline an offence of illicit enrichment that's adjudicated through criminal procedures and which potentially lead to criminal sanctions like imprisonment and fines and, and such and such. Um, but there are also many laws that target illicit enrichment that are actually based in civil procedure as well. Um, you'll hear about a few of them today as well from Kenya and Mauritius when we get to hear from the other panel members. And basically under a, a, a civil based illicit enrichment type law, um, a state can just apply for a civil order through a civil procedure where they ask a court to impose a civil sanction on a person who is not able to justify an amount of wealth that they've enjoyed. Um, under these laws, the, the people that are targeted under these laws don't face any sort of criminal sanctions whatsoever. They just basically need to satisfy a court order that requires them to compensate the state for the amount of illicit enrichment that's occurred. Um, in any case, I just wanna quickly finish my answer by, by saying that um, illicit enrichment laws in both forms, so in, in the criminal form and in the civil forms, they're really quite unique laws. Um, and they can be categorized separately from other proceeds of crime focused legislation that also exist at the moment, like uh, traditional civil recovery laws or even extended confiscation laws. As, like I said, an illicit enrichment law basically doesn't require a conviction and it doesn't even need the court to be satisfied to any degree that some sort of separate or underlying criminality has occurred that gave rise to the wealth that's, that's the, the subject of the proceedings. Instead, under an illicit enrichment law, the court just needs to be satisfied that a person's wealth isn't justified by reference to their lawful source of income. That's it. Thanks, Joe. Thank you, Andrew. Um, turning then uh, to Tom, if I may. Uh, Tom, we, we, we know, don't we, that um, uh, in the United Nations Convention Against Corruption under Article 20, um, it is uh, said that each state party should consider uh, adopting legislative and other measures as may be necessary to establish as a criminal offence 
when committed intentionally, illicit enrichment, that is a significant increase in the assets of a public official that he or she cannot reasonably explain in relation to his or her uh, lawful income. So what I'd like to ask you, Tom, uh, is how has Uganda approached the law on illicit enrichment and how does it work in practice? Uh, thank you, Joe. So Uganda has taken the route of uh, criminalizing illicit enrichment. So illicit enrichment is an offense under uh, our anti-corruption statute, and uh, it is punishable by 10 years imprisonment or payment of a fine. So what people are targeted in this offense, uh, unlike many other jurisdictions, Uganda's law on uh, illicit enrichment targets both uh, public officials and people who are not in the public service as well. So it is possible, for example, to charge uh, a procurement manager in a private company with illicit enrichment. Um, so what exactly uh, is banned in this uh, offense? The law basically bans two types of conducts. One is uh, living a luxurious lifestyle that is not commensurate with one's uh, known sources of income. Then the second conduct is uh, being in possession of property or pecuniary resources that are disproportionate with one's uh, known sources of income. Of course, in practice, it may be a very thin line to differentiate between those two types of conduct. So what are the elements that the prosecution must prove? Uh, basically, there are two elements. One is that uh, the prosecution must prove that this suspect uh, possessed property or uh, pecuniary resources or lived a certain kind of luxurious lifestyle. And secondly, the prosecution must then prove that uh, this property or pecuniary resources are disproportionate to the suspect's known sources of income. And uh, it's also important to stress that uh, unlike so many other jurisdictions like Tanzania and India, the Ugandan law on illicit enrichment does not create any presumptions in favor of the prosecution. This is a criminal offense like any other, and the prosecution has a burden of proof to prove all those ingredients that I've talked about beyond reasonable doubt. Uh, the only thing, of course, is that um, uh, still, unlike many other jurisdictions, the, the prosecution has no obligation to prove the underlying criminal activity. So all that the prosecution needs to do is to show that this person owns a lot of wealth, which cannot be explained by his lawful sources of income. So maybe quickly, I would I'd talk about what are the investigative tools that can be used by investigators during their investigations. One of them is a very uh, useful provision under the section that creates the offense of illicit enrichment. It uh, provides that a valuer who is appointed by the DPP or the IGG and who makes up evaluation in regard to certain property, that certificate of valuation shall be presumed to be accurate in regard to the value of the property. Then the other tool also is uh, asset declaration. Uh, in Uganda, as of 2021, all public servants are required to file asset declarations. And of course, this is always the start point for the investigation in such cases. Then another important tool that perhaps is not used uh, so much as it should be used is um, a provision under section 41 of our anti-corruption statute, which gives the DPP and the IGG powers to require information from public servants. And that information must be given on oath in regard to a person's uh, uh, assets and how they acquired them. So these tools, if used together with the offense itself, uh, we can have prosecutions coming through. So having secured the conviction in illicit enrichment, the prosecution can then apply for the usual confiscation under the uh, provisions of confiscation in the anti-corruption statute. So basically, that is how the law is framed in Uganda.
Thank you, Tom. Um, that's very uh, interesting to see the way that the Ugandans have approached it and also the investigative tools um, that are available to prosecutors uh, and investigators in order to uh, bring a prosecution for um, illicit enrichment. Um, as we heard from Andrew earlier, um, it's not just simply a uh, criminal uh, process. Um, in some countries, uh, there are civil uh, procedures in relation to illicit enrichment. And I'm going to turn then to uh, Philip um, to tell us about uh, Kenya and the civil procedure approach that has been taken there. Could you tell us, uh, Philip, how does the uh, illicit enrichment uh, procedure apply in Kenya? Uh, thank you, Joe. It was uh, quite interesting to listen to Tom, who's from Uganda, right next door, and things could not be more different uh, here. Uh, whereas in Uganda, there is criminalization of uh, illicit enrichment. In Kenya, we approach it uh, through the civil uh, process. Now, Kenya has uh, an Anti-Corruption and Economic Crimes Act, which was enacted in 2003. And this is important because uh, when we go uh, later into this discussion, we may want to ask why it has taken so long for us to start enjoying some successes. But in the Anti-Corruption Economic Crimes Act of, uh, of 2003, we have an entire section, uh, actually part six of the act, which uh, deals with compensation and recovery of improper benefits. Uh, specifically and th under that part of the act there is section 55. And this is the one that deals with civil forfeiture of unexplained assets. Now, the law empowers uh, the organization I work for, that's the Ethics and Anti-Corruption uh, Commission, to undertake investigations. And after establishing that there is a disproportion uh, between the known legitimate sources of income and what the suspect uh, owns, uh, we are empowered by the law to ask for an explanation. Now, that explanation, if it is not satisfactory, uh, we lead uh, the organization EACC to institute civil proceedings. Now, uh, the, again, because it's civil proceedings, we are guided by the civil procedures. So the defendants uh, are still enjoying uh, all the same rights as any defendant in any civil process, including uh, cross-examining witnesses uh, or even challenging uh, some of the uh, evidence which, which, is, which is adduced. But what is particularly interesting uh, for Kenya is that at some stage of these proceedings, because ESCC is required to demonstrate that this person is in possession of uh, unexplained assets, at that point, at that junction in the proceedings, uh, the evidentiary burden actually shifts to the defendant. So this is a bit different from uh, what we have uh, in Uganda. At that stage in the proceedings, uh, it is incumbent upon uh, the defendant to satisfy the court, and that's the word that is used in that, satisfy the court that the assets in question were acquired other than by means of corruption. And that is one of the innovative uh, things in there that helps us because at some point, only the defendant knows how he acquired those assets. So that is the legal regime. And at the end, if the court is satisfied that these uh, assets are unexplained, it can make an order directing forfeiture of all those assets to the state. So that's the legal regime specifically for civil forfeiture in Kenya. Uh, thank you, Philip. And interesting the way the way that the process starts, that uh, the, the, your agency has to establish first whether there is a disproportion um, and then allows you to ask the question before of the, um, the, the suspects, if I can put it that way, uh, before the, the process starts. I'd like to turn now to uh, Paul and Priya in Mauritius. Um, I understand that law on illicit enrichment uh, there is also in the form of a civil procedure. Is it similar to the model in Kenya or has Mauritius taken a different approach? And, and if so, what are the unique advantages of the process in uh, Mauritius? Thank you, Drew, I'll take that one. Yes, indeed, the. It's an interesting question as the Mauritian unexplained wealth regime is quite unique. I'll just give you a brief of the framework here. So the 
The agency is established under the Good Governance and Integrity Reporting Act of 2015, and it is the sole agency in Mauritius for the confiscation of unexplained wealth. So as in uh, Kenya, the Mauritian one is also a civil statute and it does not involve any criminality. So no criminal offense has to be established or linked. It is an action in REM and it's against the property and not the person. And the burden of proof is on the respondent to prove on the balance of probabilities that the source of funds used to acquire the property is legitimate. So our app is often referred to as draconian and is quite unique as I was mentioning earlier. It applies to property of citizens of Mauritius wherever located. So, um, however, there's a threshold of 10 million rupees which is approximately 250,000 US dollars. And there's also a lower limit of approximately 62,000 US dollars where cash has been seized during a criminal investigation. So the upper limit of 10 million is applicable only for properties. And uh, there is also a seven year, seven years limitation. The agency cannot confiscate any property acquired more than seven years. But we had the bright idea to amend the act, and now the clock stops ticking once we have served the statutory request on the respondent. And explain wealth also as um, Uganda and Kenya, it includes property which is owned, possessed, or under the custody or control of a person, which is disproportionate to its emoluments or other income, and which cannot be satisfactorily accounted for. There is so under the Act, there is a statutory obligation to report suspicions of unexplained wealth to the agency and also to assist in its inquiries. So those who are obliged to do that, it includes the Commissioner of Police, the Director of the Financial Intelligence Unit, the independent Director of the Independent uh, Commission Against Corruption, the Motion Revenue Authority, and other officers of statutory bodies and um, corporate bodies and public entities. Another, another feature of this unique legislation is that it takes precedence over any other agency in Mauritius in property seizures. It can work in parallel to a criminal inquiry without hindering the inquiry of uh, the other agency. And also to prevent uh, misuse of any political or personal agenda, the agency had adopted a two-tier approach which means we have the agency on one hand that investigates, analyzes, reports, and recommends to the board. And then we have an independent board, which is the integrity reporting board, who meet in closed sessions and they assess the reports provided by the, in, the agency. And they direct the agency either to do further work or take no further action or apply for an explain wealth order. So once the agency is, I mean, the board directs the agency to apply for an explain wealth order. So then the agency applies, made an application to the Supreme Court, the judge in chambers, who will either grant the unexplained wealth order or reject the application. Now, the director of uh, the agency, who is Mr. Paul Keaton, also on the panel, he is independent. He is from uh, UK and uh, not a Mauritian. He does not have any family, friends, or political affiliation in Mauritius. And also to be independent, more independent. So the board, the chairman of the board is also from the UK. He's uh, Lord Nicholas Phillips, who is the first president of the Supreme Court of the United Kingdom. So they have, we have this approach to ensure that there is full independence and um, yes, and all of us can work without any political or personal agenda. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, uh, Priya. That's a very interesting approach that um, the, the director and indeed the chairman of the board are uh, non-nationals to Mauritius to ensure their, their, their independence. Um, so we've heard now about the different uh, approaches from the different countries. And um, I'm just wondering uh, how successful have different countries been in applying um, these illicit enrichment laws? So turning to you first, Tom, if I may, uh, what are the challenges that have been faced by uh, Ugandan prosecutors in bringing illicit enrichment prosecutions? 
How have the judges uh, interpreted uh, this legislation? Uh, thank you, Joe. Um, I would say from the onset, I think the biggest challenge was uh, a lack of uh, proper understanding about this offense, because has already been noted by many of the participants, especially Andrew, it is a somewhat controversial offense. So there was a lack of a clear understanding between the investigators and the prosecutors about what exactly must be proved to secure a conviction. And of course, coupled with that is a lack of uh, uh, sufficient capacity to conduct uh, proper financial investigations. And this can be seen uh, especially in the early cases, uh, about two or three of them, which all turned into acquittals, because it was clear that uh, there was really a lack of capacity to, to conduct proper financial investigations. For example, in the case of Uganda versus Wandera, um, the prosecution really had tried to uh, in, to allege uh, illicit enrichment based on two properties that they accused owned in that case, but they did not do a good job in uh, creating a financial profile for this accused person. And they even failed to prove the official income that they accused had been earning as part of his salary as a public official. So in that case, even if it was an acquittal, uh, there's a lot of good jurisprudence that came out of it because the court uh, guided and clearly stated that this is a case of mathematical calculations and the mathematics must be with precision. It must be accurate. So the prosecution has to dig deep into the choose these financial affairs and um, also, one of the important things that came out of that case is that the, the court guided that the prosecution must focus on a certain period where they think that uh, the illicit enrichment activities were taking place. But outside that, you need to look at the accused in a wholesome manner. What did he own before that baseline period? What did he acquire in the baseline period? and what was his official income. So in trying to address all those perspectives, you'll be trying to show that in that period of focus, uh, they are choosed, um, spent more and acquired more properties than he can lawfully uh, have earned. Then in later cases, you can see that there were maybe better investigations. Uh, for example, in the recent case of Uganda versus Kazinda, we can now see that at least uh, the investigation really tried to dig deeper into the accused these uh, financial affairs. And also what is interesting in the later case of Kazinda is that um, this, uh, to put it literally, was an accused who was really living a very flamboyant life because the accused was a, a principal accountant in one of the ministries here in Uganda earning a pitiable salary of about uh, $300 per month. But uh, one of the counts uh, was that he had uh, spent on a hotel suit and office space uh, in a period of six months, he had spent about 60,000 US dollars. So you can see really the, the, the disproportionate here, like a person is earning 300 US dollars and being able to spend 60,000 US dollars in six months. So the court was clearly able to uh, pin this guy because it is clear that even if a person alleges that, you know, uh, I'm a rich man, my father uh, left for me a mansion which I inherited, but the, the question would be during this baseline period that we're focusing on, that mansion did not help you because it did not generate any money. So where did you get this money that you managed to spend in this luxurious hotel? And also in that case, of course, the conduct of the accused person himself really gave him away because while he was spending in this hotel, he knew that as a public official, he could not justify those expenditures if there was an investigation. So he booked into the hotel using a name of a proxy and he also acquired properties, but he was using proxies. So all this conduct now came back to bite him at the trial. And maybe another important thing that came out of the Kazinda case, uh, the judge stressed on the issue of asset declaration forms 
and the judge was very clear that uh, the requirement to fill asset decla declaration forms is not a mere formality. It is a requirement of law and the accused person undertakes while filling that form that the information they're giving is true and complete. So if an accused, for example, in his declaration form denies of having any other sources of income, he doesn't have any property, then at the trial in his defense, he comes and turns around and says, oh, you see, I have this mansion that my grandmother uh, left for me. You know, the court will not believe that kind of evidence anymore. So um, I would say that um, right now, I think uh, prosecutors and investigators are having a better understanding of this offense. And uh, with uh, also research works that are coming out, like Andrew's book, I'm sure uh, we shall feel more confident going forward handling this offence. Thank you, Tom. And, and it, it just goes to show, doesn't it, that the, uh, as, as we always say, the importance of a, a thorough financial investigation, perhaps even more so in relation to uh, these illicit enrichment um, proceedings, um, it really is very important. Um, turning then, if I can, to, to Philip and the uh, approach that they have had in uh, Kenya with the uh, EACC, um, you've had some successes with um, your unexplained assets mechanism. What, what, what are the best practices that the EACC have developed um, when trying to identify and recover unexplained assets and, and what sort of challenges have been faced in Kenya uh, to uh, litigate this law? Uh, thanks, Joe. Uh, indeed, uh, uh, EACC has enjoyed uh, some success in recent years, and I'm happy that some of my colleagues are probably tuned in and they're listening because these are some of the cases they've conducted. But before I go to the successes, I think it's better to talk about uh, the challenges because it's an evolutionary process. Uh, remember when we were talking about the law in Kenya, we said at some point uh, we issue a notice and require that this person explains the source uh, of these assets. Uh, and one of the first cases we took to court, actually we were sued, was when we invited a cabinet secretary to explain uh, the source of his assets. And the high court uh, decided that what we did was wrong, it was unprocedural because we were asking him to explain before we conducted the investigation properly. And the right procedure was for us to investigate first uh, before demanding an explanation. And notwithstanding the fact that EACC uh, lost the case, we, we, we are in agreement with the court that that is the right procedure. And it is because we have been employing the right procedure now that we've started seeing some success. And the case that comes to mind uh, is a case that involves a gentleman known as Stanley Mombo Amuti. Uh, he, he was working for the National Water Conservation and Pipeline Corporation. He was a finance manager. And in a period of 10 months, uh, I must mention period because even Tom says that uh, their law now insists on a period. In a period of 10 months, uh, we saw a heavy traffic of cash uh, in excess of $400,000. Uh, now the case, uh, when it was first heard to conclusion, was thrown out on a technicality. Uh, apparently, the High Court had an issue with the shifting of the uh, evidentiary burden, the one that I'd mentioned earlier, and it said that it appeared that we were imposing uh, a higher threshold on the defendant than that which was uh, imposed on EACC. Uh, of course, we disagreed and we went to the Court of Appeal and the Court of Appeal overturned that decision. But instead of uh, listening to the appeal on merit, it asked us to start the matter afresh. And so when we took over the matter and started hearing it afresh, one of the innovations that we employed was instead of relying on affidavit evidence, we now put the gentleman on the stand. And here's the remarkable thing. You put the guy on the stand and you ask him to explain why on one particular day, he deposited a uh, thousand, well, $1,000, which is 100,000 Kenya shillings, 16 times through the ATM, walked across the street, went to another bank, uh, deposited another $1,000 16 times. I think he got tired, went home, took a nap, came back the next day, went to Barclays, uh, deposited another uh, $20,000 uh, in cash. And when you put this person on the stand, it's very different from having 
uh, affidavits and then you file written submissions and you have people obfuscating issues and you know too many legal arguments. This gentleman has to stand in front of the judge. And remember the judge is also a, a public servant. We know what the salaries are for public servants because we can look at the, 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 the asset declarations. In Kenya, we call them the declaration of income, assets and liabilities. So we need to see what your income is, what your assets are and what your liabilities are. And when you have this, this person standing in front of the judge and trying uh, to, to explain, and sometimes we've, we've seen judicial officers confounded by explanations because this person will suggest that he was a farmer or he was running some certain enterprise, but there's no evidence to back it up. And the beauty is that once we succeeded in this first one, you know, it became like uh, there's some snowball uh, effect. We, he appealed, we went to the court of appeal and the court of appeal crystallized all those ingredients into four. One, that there must be a period of time as is the case in Uganda. Two, there must be a disproportion and this is a disproportion between non-legitimate sources of income on the one hand and the assets he possesses. The third ingredient uh, is that there must be reasonable suspicion of corruption. Uh, I must emphasize that there is nothing wrong with being wealthy, even if you're a public servant. But if there is even a whiff uh, of corrupt conduct, that gives us reasonable suspicion. And uh, what we were suspecting uh, at the time was that the guy was receiving kickbacks. And the, the financial investigations, as you mentioned, Joe, if quality financial investigations are conducted, you will see that there's a, a money trail and you could see the kickback. And the last uh, ingredient, the fourth one, was that he was given an opportunity to explain and that the explanation was unsatisfactory. And because of this, all the assets which were in question were declared to be unexplained and they were forfeited. Again, the beauty is that because this was a court of appeal, that decision is now binding on uh, our high courts and we were able to cite it with clarity. Uh, and that is what you would call the locus classicus uh, with regard to uh, unexplained assets in Kenya. Thank you, Philip. Um, very, very interesting to, to, to be reminded, I guess, of the, the value of um, having a witness, um, having to give, a, give account for their actions um, in front of the judge and, and being questioned about it rather than simply uh, dealing with the case on the papers and affidavits. So I'm gonna turn now, uh, please, to uh, Paul um, and just ask, in relation to uh, the legislation in Mauritius. How has that been put into practice and, and, and what successful cases have you had there? And, and in particular, what challenges um, have been faced by your agency in the efforts to recover unexplained wealth? Uh, well, thank, thank you, Joe. I think the first thing is I, um, I envy Philip in a way because uh, my background was fraud investigation and interviewing people, and I, I missed a personal touch. But um, we've had uh, three applications. One walked through very easily. The man was in jail, uh, suspected uh, drug dealing, and he was on remand, and we, we took, the, we took uh, the money off him. It was in excess, obviously, in excess of 10 million. Uh, the second one is a bit more complicated because it involves the uh, former prime minister and that's got been kicking around the courts for a long, long time. And it would take a, a, a whole day, I think, to, to go through the ins and outs. But an interesting case study, an interesting example of the law in action was in, Ju in July 2018, the respondent's uh, daughter and son-in-law were interdicted at the airport en route to China, carrying uh, undisclosed uh, currency, US dollars and uh, euros. And the police, that is the anti-drug smuggling unit, uh, searched their, their premises. Uh, the family lived in a multi-story multi, multi -story house and they found about a, a further $1.6 million in uh, notes and uh, currency, different currencies including pounds sterling, euros, and dollars, and also in Mauritian rupees. Now, uh, we, wrote a, we wrote the lady a statutory request in July 2018, and it came back in effect that uh, she was the sole owner 
of four businesses that worked in the garment industry for, for cash. So the, the preliminary uh, investigation that we did, or the uh, intelligence, the FIU, uh, Financial Intelligence Unit, provided us with a list of the bank accounts. So the family, family members had between them 31 personal and uh, business bank accounts. And the FIU had ref referred the matter to the Independent Commission Against Corruption for suspicions of, of money laundering. So when we wrote to the, the lady, she uh, sent back a cash flow statement, a consolidated cash flow statement, which purported to be to show that the uh, the money that was found by the police, the cash that was found by the police, was the result of the normal business that she undertook, cash-rich business. And during the, the period from July 2018 to November 2019, or well, actually to July 2019, she submitted a total of... Uh, six affidavits, uh, one, one or two of them dealt with the property, she had a movable property, and the others uh, dealt with the cash and trying to show how her uh, business had generated the, these amounts of, of property, uh, or the, these amounts of cash. Um, and so that was a long, actually quite a long drawn out uh, affair. Now, what happened was the the affidavits were contradictory. Uh, they didn't tell us anything. They were repetitive. And uh, you, we gave her every opportunity uh, because we, we strive to be very, very careful. Um, but she didn't, didn't respond. We gave her one last chance. And then she submitted an affidavit, which, is, which might ring true to our fe fellow panelists. Suddenly, she was a poor, confused, honest businesswoman, poorly educated and uh, didn't know and didn't keep proper records, et cetera, et cetera. And unfortunately, she was a company. She'd been a company director for 23 years and submitted yearly audited financial statements. So that didn't wash. So we applied for an unexplained wealth order. Now, if you look at the challenge that was in 2019. She only submitted her rebuttal, her affidavit in rebuttal, in May 2021. Why? Because the proceedings were adjourned a total of 12 times uh, with under what I could only describe as flagrant um, abuses of um, due process. Firstly, we had her lawyers uh, asking for adjournments because they didn't understand the case and it was too complicated and then they needed time to uh, get to grips with it and then they changed lawyers and the new lawyers wanted time to understand the case and get to grips with it and then they changed lawyers back to the original ones and uh, then they started other obfuscations and delays uh, which, you know, unfortunately, the court granted them adjournments. So, for example, we had the case where lead counsel for the lady, who incidentally represents the former prime minister, um, said that he or averred that he would uh, review her affidavit. So a couple of adjournments were, were given on, uh, on that ground, on those grounds, to allow him to review it and prepare it properly, make sure it's prepared properly. And then when he was due to submit it, he challenged the court's jurisdiction. The, the court is the Supreme Court judge in chambers. And he challenged the court's jurisdiction to hear the case. Now, he knew full well that the uh, judge in chambers had uh, jurisdiction because he had pleaded that case on behalf of the former prime minister. So he was a party to that decision. So that was, I think you could say in, in slang, that was gaming the system. So it's gone on. COVID-19 provided a useful, useful excuse for, for not uh, bringing in the affidavits. And then eventually 
the, the, I think the last throw of the dice was that the affidavit was submitted, but not signed. And that took another few weeks to, to transpire. So we now have the case that her rebuttal was actually, um, so-called rebuttal, was actually lodged before the court in May 2021. And the court allowed uh, a further adjournment. We, we, we replied, and she didn't come up with anything. Uh, instead, the, uh, what she was asking for was to be heard in, in, uh, in person, to give evidence and to uh, call members of her family to act as character witnesses and the rest of it. So be that as it may. So it was given a, a final uh, adjournment to the 24th of June, which as you can note as well passed, and a final, final splurge was given to the 16th of July. Now, the lady does not have a defense because uh, she has utterly failed to demonstrate or to explain, provide a reasonable uh, account for how she got that money. And the twists and turns have been involving, uh, she suddenly invented a new class of sales. She exports to a country which has a, a bank account which was not known to her auditors. So she's, she's managed to publish uh, audited accounts whilst keeping bank account, foreign bank accounts, away from her auditors. And she invented, for example, to show the flexibility of the lady's mind, she invented a new class of export sales, which involved recipients, instead of receiving them by ship and in uh, containers and depositing the, the money into her bank account in Mayotte, for example, this new class of uh, export sales were dealt with when by uh, customers coming in to Mauritius, carrying huge quantities of cash, paying her in cash, and then uh, exporting the, the goods themselves, which doesn't really ring true. It doesn't, uh, the thing just fell apart. So we're waiting with bated breath for, you know, for, the, for our day in court. And that, that actually is the, the major distraction to the agency is the delays, the unnecessary delays and abuses of process, which sometimes judges are, are minded to grant simply because they're not actually really comfortable with the legislation and they strive to be extremely fair. Um, but I think, you know, that, that avenue now has, uh, has, has long passed. Thank you, Paul. Um, it's uh, interesting to note that um, the suspect in that case, um, or, or the the, uh, the person who you've been uh, applying for an unexplained wealth order against, uh, has said that she wants to have her day in court. But when we bear in mind uh, Philip's uh, explanation in, in his cases uh, as to uh, how that can perhaps backfire um, on the person uh, who is being challenged. Um, Andrew, we, we, we are a little bit uh, uh, running over time, but I, I'd like to ask you, um, if I can, um, what are some of the common legal challenges uh, to illicit enrichment laws? Uh, I appreciate that we have very different contexts. Um, we have the, the criminal context, the civil context, um, and what, what are the different challenges that are perhaps common within each of the, of the different systems that you've seen in your research. Um, thanks, Joe. Yeah, you're, you're absolutely right. So um, whenever a country introduces an illicit enrichment law, um, it's, it's very common that this law just gets challenged somehow. Um, the challenges also do vary, uh, as you said, um, depending on whether or not a particular illicit enrichment law is a criminal one or a civil one. Um, as certain rights uh, come into play a bit more if a person can be subjected to criminal sanctions like imprisonment. Um, in both cases though, uh, most legal challenges to an illicit enrichment law will often focus on the fact that these types of laws don't require a court to be satisfied that a person's wealth has come from illegal sources. Um, they, they just need to be satisfied that that wealth hasn't been justified 
in reference to their lawful income. So they don't, there doesn't really need to be any proof of criminality. And, and this definitely gives rise to a lot of challenges in both contexts. Um, it, to give an example in the criminal context, uh, legal challengers often argue that this particular point um, contravenes the presumption of innocence. Um, and they claim that uh, illicit enrichment laws effectively allow a court to make a presumption that certain items, items of wealth uh, were obtained by a person through unlawful sources. Um, they argue that this presumption in turn sort of unfairly reverses the burden of proof onto an accused person in an illicit enrichment trial and requires them to produce evidence to a certain standard that establishes the non-criminal sources of their own wealth. Um, <laughs> Interestingly, when, when these challenges have been dealt with, the, the vast majority of courts actually agree with this point. Um, they often agree that illicit enrichment laws do give rise to a presumption that certain items of wealth were not lawfully sourced, and that as a result of this presumption, a burden um, in the trial can be effectively placed on an accused person uh, to rebut this presumption. And even more interestingly, um, most courts also acknowledge that this presumption and the reversal do actually run contrary to the presumption of innocence principle. Um, but in saying that, the vast majority of courts have still deemed illicit enrichment laws to be acceptable legal mechanisms. So obviously the question that comes out of that is um, how, do they, how do they justify this? Uh, the way that they do that is that the overwhelming majority of courts take the view that the presumption of innocence principle is not an absolute principle um, and that it's acceptable for certain laws to deviate from the presumption of innocence principle in certain circumstances. And there's actually quite a lot of precedent that uh, exists in courts around the world, including the European Courts of Human Rights, that says the exact same thing, that the presumption of innocence isn't an absolute principle and it's possible to deviate from the principle in certain circumstances. Um, what amounts to an acceptable circumstance to deviate from the presumption of innocence principle, that, that changes from, from jurisdiction to jurisdiction. Um, but in the context of illicit enrichment laws, uh, some courts have, have, have ruled that these deviations were acceptable because of a number of reasons, uh, either because they thought that devi the deviation was uh, in the public interest specifically in the context of corruption, uh, or because uh, they think the deviation is acceptable because the facts that an accused person actually has to prove to rebut a presumption are specifically with their own knowledge, or also courts sometimes felt that uh, the deviation from the presumption of innocence principle that was done by illicit enrichment laws was usually acceptable because the state in proceedings under these laws still need to prove the primary facts of the accusation in the proceedings. Um, other courts, again, on this, on this particular line, take a completely different response, as Tom sort of alluded to in, in Uganda. Um, some courts actually just don't think that the burdens are reversed under their illicit enrichment laws, so the, the presumption of innocence principle can't be violated. Um, overall, however, the justifications on this issue um, and, the, and the wider arguments surrounding this issue in general uh, they're obviously a lot more in depth than what I can cover today. So I would encourage people to read my book. So um, I, do, I do include an entire part on this particular argument. So if you've got the time, have a look. Um, so just to finish, I, I would like to quickly, if we've got a bit of time to, to flip over to Tom, because there are other challenges that also are quite common with regards to illicit enrichment proceedings. So um, Often, often people challenge along the lines that uh, illicit enrichment laws go against the principle of retroactivity and, and also property rights. And I know that this is something that Tom has uh, studied a little bit in the context of Uganda because it's actually arisen in Uganda. So maybe Tom, do you want to quickly give a couple of minutes of response on that? Yeah, thank you, and Andrew. Tom, when, you, when you answer that, can I, can I also put to you the question that has appeared in the, um, in the, in the chat or question and answers? about the defence raising the argument that um, uh, compelling a suspect to provide information contravenes the right against self-incrimination and the right to silence. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Joe. Um, maybe to begin with your last question, Joe, um, and I think it is David who had asked that question in regard to Section 41 of our anti-corruption statute. Fortunately, there hasn't been a constitutional petition in that direction. 
uh, but I, I I anticipate that it might be possible because um, not only does that law require a suspect to provide information, but unlike so many other similar laws, the evidence obtained in that process can actually be used in a criminal prosecution. So it is very possible that that will be challenged in the near future. Now, moving on to the uh, already petitions that have been filed, there have been a couple. Uh, in one case, uh, that is uh, Nesta Machumbi versus Atone Geno. Uh, the suspect had been charged over properties that he had acquired before the act was passed. So he challenged these proceedings on the basis that uh, they were against uh, Article 28 of our constitution, which forbids uh, uh, charging people with uh, you know, retroactively. Uh, but the court uh, did not agree with him. The court reasoned that even if he had acquired those properties before the act came into place, he continued owning those properties and was actually owning the properties at the time he was charged. So the fact that he had acquired them before the act came into place did not really matter since he continued owning them. Another interesting petition that came up also as uh, in the case of Akankwasa versus Atone Geno, there the applicant tried to challenge this law on illicit enrichment bizarrely on the premise that it violates the right to own property under Article 26 of Uganda's constitution. And again, the court obviously threw that argument out, reasoning that uh, the right to own property only protects a person to the extent that he's owning property that he acquired lawfully and not through illicit or criminal means. So, so far, all the challenges to this offense have not been successful in Uganda. Thank you, Tom. Um, and I'm, I'm just going to ask then uh, the panelists to consider uh, just one of the questions that we have in the um, in the chat. Um, and, and it's this, and it's raised by a couple of people. And I, I wonder if you could each answer um, from Kenya perspective and, and the Ugandan perspective and also Mauritius. Um, the, and the question is this, um, are there any difficulties obtaining information and evidence from abroad? Uh, due to the great variety of laws in, in different countries. And, and, and equally, uh, another question was asked about um, uh, illicit enrichment legislation, which is being described as controversial, draconian, um, and the fact that many states, particularly in Europe, don't have these provisions. Um, have the panelists had experiences with freezing, forfeiting, or returning assets from illicit enrichment in relation to other jurisdictions. Um, so I, I'd be grateful if the, uh, the panelists could, could answer uh, that question. Over to you, Tom, I think first. Okay, uh, thank you, Joe. Uh, from what I know, uh, we haven't tried to obtain any evidence from abroad in regard to the offenses that have been taken to court, but I can imagine that it would be problematic because uh, this is a criminal offense and mostly that evidence would probably be required from uh, the West, European countries are that. And as Andrew notes in his book, many of the countries in Europe do not have uh, criminal provisions to do with illicit enrichment. So in regard to the principle of dual criminality, I can imagine that that will be a very big problem to obtain evidence from abroad in respect to this uh, offense. And Philip? Uh, well, if if there are challenges with regard to getting uh, evidence from abroad, it's, it's mostly uh, magistical. Uh, when you invoke the mutual legal assistance uh, process, uh, that takes time. Uh, in some cases, uh, it's made even more difficult because we need to translate uh, the request to a foreign language. Uh, and of course, there's the issue of uh, whatever it is we are complaining of here in Kenya has to be an offense uh, in the other jurisdiction, but mostly to be a logistical issue. And sometimes uh, we can tell that there is unwillingness uh, from the other uh, country to, to give us that information. But uh, if I have a minute, uh, Joe, because there was another question in the, uh, in, in the chat, and this was with regard to beneficial ownership, I'm happy to report that uh, 
the most recent decision in Kenya, which was in March 2021. I don't know, Andrew, maybe you didn't catch this one uh, in your book, uh, involved uh, an accountant who was in the Ministry of Finance. And in that case, the court went so far as uh, to make a declaration that whatever assets were registered in the names of proxies, uh, the beneficial owner was actually the defendant. The defendant's name was uh, Patrick Ochieno uh, Abachi. So at least we've gone that far in terms of the jurisprudence. And uh, one last item uh, I can mention is with regard to Paul's concern. Uh, and this is about uh, people telling lies about uh, how they came to be in possession of certain assets. Uh, one of the cases I found uh, uh, quite reliable is a Jamaican case where uh, it says that the court, if the court establishes or confirms that this was an untruth or that the explanation was a lie, it is allowed to draw an inference that uh, those assets were acquired corruptly. So it's a, it's a decent judgment to use, especially because we always catch them out in a lie. Thank you. And if I can then just, thank you, Philip. If I can then just turn quickly to, to Paul. Um, we, we know from uh, what Priya told us earlier that uh, your law applies to assets where uh, ever they may help be held in the world. Um, have you uh, had the opportunity to uh, seek assistance from overseas um, in any of your cases yet? Yes, we had uh, a couple of pets that had London property. And uh, now we were able to, to, through open sources, we were able to do a lot of, lot of research on, on that. Um, and in fact, in this particular case, uh, the money could the the property could be properly accounted for. So although they were pets, doesn't necessarily make them evil people. But we did we did talk to the National Crime Agency, and the National Crime Agency were very very positive. That's our been our experience, and they looked for further assets and they gave us whatever assistance they could. So that that is our experience. If for example, if we get an unexplained wealth order against a property and we can't enforce the, uh, we, because we can't enforce the Mauritian law in, say, France or something like that, we can't get assistance, then the judge can rule that the respondent must pay the cash equivalent, must give the cash equivalent. And of course, if they can't do that, or if they do, I might ask them where they got the money from, but if they can't do it, then we will bankrupt them, take their house, and do whatever we can. Okay, well, thank you very much. That's a very, very interesting approach. And there is a section uh, from one of the guest authors in the, um, uh, in the book uh, about uh, international, uh, obtaining international assistance. Um, well, we've run slightly over time. Um, I'm, I'm sorry for that, uh, but I think it's been an interesting and enlightening uh, talk and discussion, understanding how the very different processes uh, in relation to illicit enrichments uh, have taken place uh, or been introduced in the different countries. The, the criminal procedure um, within Uganda and the, the reminder um, that it is uh, a mathematical, mathematical um, equation, um, but that uh, as, as with all of these uh, processes, it needs to be founded on a a, a strong financial investigation. Uh, we've learned also about the use of the other uh, legislation, the importance of asset declaration uh, legislation, um, and uh, also the, the interesting approach that's been taken by Mauritius with the, uh, the uh, unexplained wealth orders um, and the, the independence of the, uh, the director and also the, the board before um, such applications can be brought. Um, as you are aware, um, the book on illicit enrichment uh, is available on the uh, Basel Institute on Governance website. Uh, there will be a link to it in um, the uh, email that will follow uh, this event. Um, this event has now been recorded and it will be available hopefully on YouTube um, within the next day or so and uh, the link to the YouTube will be in the email as well. So all that remains uh, for me to say is to thank each of our uh, panellists, Andrew, Tom, uh, Philip, uh, Paul and Priya, and to thank you, the attendees, for your uh, valued questions uh, that you've put forward as well. And thank you very much.
Thank you, Joe. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.